Hello YouTube. In this video we're going to take a look at this little setup here and uh, in particular the compact eye pack that you see on the left hand side. Now this is not to be confused with the eye pack line of PDAs that Compaq and HP produced later on. This is an actual desktop computer in the class of legacy free computers nonetheless. They, they call this machine, these machines this way because they don't have any real legacy connectors. I'll just uh, take out all the uh, devices on the back so we can take a look at said connectors. There we go. Here on the front all we have is the big power button, the indicator light for power, hard disk indicator, microphone in, headphone out, and these two USB 1.1 ports. If you take a look around the back of the machine, there we go, you can see another line in, line out, fast Ethernet, so 100 megabit, the VGA port, and three more USB 1.1 ports. And on the bottom we have a power supply. That's all there is to it, that's all the ports you get. You get five USB 1.1 ports, a VGA port, Ethernet, and some, some way to plug in your uh, speakers if you don't want to use the built-in one. The button here on the back is for ejecting the uh, modular bay in the front. There we go, it's a bit unwieldy. But that's this bay over here, you can put a CD-ROM drive or a floppy drive in there. I don't have such a thing. <clears throat> we found this thing on the attic at my girlfriend's place, so she figured this would be a good uh, subject for a video, so well, here it is. Uh, it's got a fresh copy of uh, Windows 2000 Professional on it. I updated it to uh, Service Pack 5.1. And uh, just so you can get a better look inside this thing, we just uh, pull out the side panel like we, I just did. And now we can see a lot of the most important components. Right here we have the RAM. There's 256 megabytes of PC133 in here even though this system can only really take advantage up to PC100 because this uses the Intel 810 chipset which is limited to 100 MHz FSB um, and the CPU is actually running at 66 because it's a Celeron it's a Celeron Mendocino 500 MHz and uh, the hard drive over here is a 7.8 GB I think or 8 GB uh, okay yeah 8.4 GB it says right on the label uh, from Seagate, and it's the original drive that came with the machine in the year 2000. So you might be wondering, a machine in the year 2000 with just a 500 megahertz Celeron, that's not exactly powerful, is it? Well, you would be right. These machines were pretty much just used as internet access computers. Um, at the time, you didn't really need too much memory or CPU to browse the internet, because the connection speeds were, were slow enough to not really need a hell of a lot of uh, powers. Power and um, there wasn't a lot of multimedia going on on the internet yet. So uh, around that time, it would have been perfectly normal to have just this as a as your computer to get online and do your word processing, and uh, it would have been fine. It originally came with 64 megabytes of RAM. In the year 2000, that was enough to get by with doing your basic tasks. These machines were pretty cheap too, so you know it's a win-win in that regard. Right, so uh, without further ado, let's actually turn it on and uh, see how this machine performs. And uh, we'll uh, take a little bit of a tour uh, software-wise. Alright, we're ready to go. Let's turn her on. Just a little bit of a history behind this computer. Like I said, we dug it up from the attic at my girlfriend's place. and. Um, this used to belong to a public library and uh, it still had the background and everything and the original image that would have uh, been normal for that uh, particular business so but, uh, of course we had to wipe that because quite frankly uh, uh, not only couldn't we get in because it was protected in some way um, but also just to make sure that there's no more personal information on it you never know, even if it's it's a public access machine, you never know what people do with them. So, But because we didn't have a CD-ROM drive, we had to uh, make a uh, remote install server on Windows 2000 server in a virtual machine, in our case. And we uh, loaded Windows 2000 up over the network, and that worked just fine. 
And so uh, now it's running a perfectly uh, decent copy of Windows 2000 Professional. The original image was Service Pack 3. I, of course, upgraded it to uh, Service Pack 5, the unofficial one, so you can get all the updates and feature sets and stuff uh, going. And the only real uh, downside on this machine is actually the hard drive, because this is a really old drive and it's, it's, uh, it's pretty bad, it's, it's very slow. But, uh, There we go, that's the speaker. But um, yeah, it's very slow and it's the it's really holding the system back. I think a 500 megahertz Celeron can do uh, can be a little bit more a little bit faster than this machine is showing. So who knows? I might upgrade the hard drive in this at some point because I have plenty of IDE drives laying around to uh, give that a whirl. Maybe that'll uh, make it a little bit uh, more responsive. Not that you can do a whole lot with a machine like this anymore because it has Intel integrated graphics on the Intel A10 chipset, which is 4 megabytes and it's of course integrated, so not designed to do anything more than your typical word processing or web browsing. Uh, it doesn't have a whole lot of RAM, well 256 is enough for Windows 2000, that's for sure. But uh, yeah, the internet is too modern for this machine now, I mean you can only run up to Firefox 10, well not going to bother with kernel X and stuff like that. Might as well install Windows XP if you're going to do that. But um, yeah, let's actually open up a Wi Fi hopper here because I installed a uh, USB Wi Fi card in the back because this room doesn't have Ethernet and I don't feel like um, for one video just putting a bunch of cables down here. Or, well, down here. It's only about, I think, about 10 meters or so from the router, but uh, I don't care. Okay, let's connect. If it wants to. Sometimes it needs two tries to get to connected. Yeah, it's gonna give us a hard time here. Let's just focus on the display for now. Good enough about that, yeah. Now it says not connected. I'll have to reconnect it. This software is not wireless and aware, so that's a thing. There we go, we're connected and we have an IP address. So we could browse the web now in theory. So let's open up Internet Explorer. And as you can see that comes up pretty quickly. Now we wait for the msn.com website. You know, it is actually pretty usable. It's it's pretty quick. Let's go to one of my favorite websites that I frequent. Right, I had to put www in front of it or whatever. I don't know. Yeah, I can't access that website. That's the, that's the trouble with IE6. It's completely useless now. So you have to rely on a different web browser. But there aren't too many options for Windows 2000 if you don't want to go kernel X or upgrade to Windows XP. And I really don't care about uh, any of those options. This is the last version of Firefox that will run natively on unmodified Windows 2000. And as you can see, resolving takes a lot more time. But we will at least get a very true rendition of the website, unlike IE6. The trouble with that, of course, is that it's really going to be pretty slow. It's still not quite finished loading, so it has to load the ads and whatnot. Yeah, this is not really a great experience at all. But then again, it's a 500 mega Celeron, and this is Firefox 11, I think, or well, it's 10 point something uh, long term support edition, or ESR, extended support release. So, internet browsing is not really. Well, it used to be its, its primary use case, but it's, it's not quite usable anymore after 17 years of uh, innovation. But it's still a perfectly capable word processor. Here we go, Word 2000 came up very, very quickly. 
And here we can do anything we want. Let's put in a Lucida console. That's perfectly working. And of course, there's Clippy, little bastard. He still hasn't left. There we go. Get lost, little prick. So yeah, well, it's still a capable work processor. You can still make your PowerPoint presentations if uh, if you desire to use old templates. You can of course do some spreadsheeting as well. That's all working just fine. Fox 2000 runs like a dream on this machine, that's for sure. So let's take another look at the hardware side of things. Let's start up uh, with let's start with CPU Z, so we can take a look at uh, the uh, CPU and the memory configuration and stuff like that. Oh, by the way, uh, I see my camera's battery is running out, so I will resume the video once I've swapped the batteries. All right, back for more action. Here we can see the CPU. It is running an Intel Celeron with the Mendocino Core, Sucker 370 processor, 500 megahertz. Uh, with a 66 megahertz bus, 128 kilobytes of level 2 cache. So this is at least a Pentium 3 era Celeron, not just a Pentium 2 Celeron, because uh, the very first Celerons didn't even have level 2 cache, at least this is 128k, it's not a lot, but you know, I guess it's something, at least. The system is very responsive overall. Um, and we can see here that the board manufacturer is compact, it's a custom board, with of course a custom BIOS that it has a password on it that we uh, cannot get off, unfortunately. Um, BIOS date is uh, 13th of November of the year 2000. So it is most definitely uh, approaching its 17 years old. It's got two sticks of 128 megabytes SD RAM, just regular single database memory. They're both uh, made by Infineon which is a subsidiary of Hynix, I think. And uh, here is the graphics card, the Intel 810 graphics controller that's built into the chipset. So not really all that exciting, is it? I also installed Everest Home Edition so I could see what the temperatures would do in a system like this. Because as far as I can see, there is no fan in this system, it's just a big heatsink that's on the CPU. And the only thing you really hear is the hard drive. So I figured uh, that was the case. So I was uh, going to look at the temperatures and I was actually pleasantly surprised. Maybe I should uh, bring that up a little bit. The CPU temperature is at 38 degrees centigrade right now. And the motherboard is at 28 and the hard drive is at 29. So it's a pretty cool running system, despite uh, having just a passive heatsink to uh, keep it cool. That's a pretty ballsy approach, even back in the year 2000. I guess they figured this 1998 uh, released Celeron would be not that power hungry. It isn't. It's only like a 27 watt CPU. So it's not going to consume a whole lot of power. And in that regard, I think these machines could still make you could still be made useful as long as their power supplies don't blow up because their proprietary is all hell and cannot be replaced easily. But you could still use these for a very simple task. I mean, they have fast ethernet, fast ethernet, so I suppose if you slap in a big hard drive, you could make it into a file share just for some quick access files. Um, perhaps you could run uh, like a small web server or some kind of, or like a TeamSpeak server, something like that. You could perfectly run that on one of these. You're never going to saturate a full 100 megabit link with just VoIP traffic uh, with, with those cl with typical clients like Fontrello or, or TeamSpeak or Mumble. That's not going to happen in any way. So, you know, I guess that's, well, so, sorry, I guess that's a very, very nice use case for a machine like this. Or just, you know, for the sake of what I do on my channel, putting uh, era correct software on it and just uh, take a poking, uh, poking fun at it and see what I can make it do in its original configuration. The only thing that I really had to change though was that 64 megs of RAM, because even on Windows 2000, that's quite a drag and it's not exactly fun putting anything else on here because it only has USB ports and if you swap hardware around you're gonna have to 
have an operating system that can handle that in the background. So you can't really do Windows 95 or Windows 98 or ME on a machine like this. It is supported from uh, from the manufacturer Compaq, but uh, it's really not a good idea because if you swap out a different set of like a different keyboard and different mouse, it has to be USB, so it, can, it has to be reinitialized and the driver has to be reconfigured and it usually only happens after you've actually clicked to log on in Windows 9X and that would just put you in a whole heap of trouble. But that pretty much concludes this video. The last thing that I want to uh, just, you know, make you experience is the is the built-in speaker. I want to say on board and built-in at the same time. That's not going to work. But uh, it is a pretty potent little speaker. So let's play a little bit of music that we can find in the media folder. Let's go MIDI, even though it's just wavetable synthesis software. Uh, let's do the classic Canyon test. I have to say that the sound of this thing is pretty uh, remarkable. And that concludes my video. Hope you enjoyed this video. I thank you all for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next one.